So another um, issue involves international research. And what's the position of authorship between researchers from Western and Eastern countries or develop and developing countries. And there's been studies looking at the frequency with which researchers from developing countries are first authors. And uh, to make a long story short, uh, frequently or not infrequently, researchers from developing countries are not uh, uh, first authors, even though they've been the major drivers of the research. So there's a um, exploitation factor uh, existing in international research as well. Uh, and, and that's a, a very involved subject as well. Um, what, what can I say? Whenever you have a hierarchy, you're gonna have these issues of who's gonna be uh, uh, lead author, senior author, and who's gonna be in the very ambiguous middle of the list. Um, and, and so that's, well, that's an issue in that realm of authorship as well. So any other, uh, oh yeah, back to the culture issue. Um, it, um, well, again, um, it's a, always an interesting issue about uh, universalism and relativism when it comes to ethics and when when, when should um, cultural aspects should be respected and when should uh, cultural aspects be changed? Uh, and that's, sometimes that's not an easy question to um, answer. So let me just say that um, one, time, one time I heard a very engaging uh, presentation from someone who wrote about ethical universalism and relativism. And, and she said, um, well, uh, one, one could get a sense that a cultural explanation for a practice is probably not correct if it impinges on someone's rights, human rights. Uh, so uh, that may sound ambiguous, uh, but if someone has done the work um, and it's his, uh, then one could say is it's his or her right to be first author. And one could say that um, this so-called cultural factor uh, uh, should should not um, uh, should not hold on. Uh, and the other the other thing I think about in philosophy, we have this phrase, and an is is not an ought, meaning just because it has happened before doesn't make it right. So, you know, many times you hear the argument from someone, uh, well, yeah, this is ethical, why? Oh, because we've always done it that way, all right? Uh, I, I'm sure you probably heard that before. Uh, well, just because it's been done before 
doesn't make it right. Uh, so, and is, is not an ought. So, uh, so the cultural aspect uh, could, could be hard to navigate around. Uh, and, uh, but um, uh, I can't uh, tell you how many times I've heard the phrase, well, it's in our culture. And that's the explanation I get for, for many practices, but let me leave it at there. Any final thoughts? I would like to add something quickly, Henry, because I want to add another resource for folks to take a look at, which relates back to some of the conversations earlier about some of these lists of predatory journals, and they kind of intersect with this idea of authorship and ethical conduct of the research process, not just actually dealing with your data and your, your, your patients, or your participants, but with your co-authors and the whole thing. So, and um, on, on the universal thing, uh, I do want to just mention this because I think a lot of philosophical approaches and universalist approaches towards what is ethical are based on Western thought. So I just want to put that out there that there is, a, you know, there are histories behind how we understand the individual, the collective, and a lot of, I think, scientific research has adopted that stance as a standard. Um, so just, just to, you know, I think that's a conversation that is necessary to have, particularly considering the diverse crowd of folks we have in this group. Um, and I do agree, Henry, that cop out and so that's just cultural. It's like, well, but I think there needs to be, sometimes things are done differently in different contexts. Doesn't mean they're better or worse. It just means that there are different standards, right? And so being aware of that is important. Anyway, it's just a sort of thought. The, the source I want to share with you, it's a, it's a blog post by somebody, I forgot who it was, but it's somebody, a colleague of mine shared it with me a few weeks ago. It's called The Institutionalized Racism of Scholarly Publishing. <laughs> kind of a heavy title, bam, right in your face. But it is interesting to read it. It mentions um, Beale's list. It mentions the other, the Cabell's blacklist of predatory journals. I think somebody asked about Cabell's earlier. So that's where I've seen that. But it also really looks at things about, you know, how quickly Western groups and institutions are, are quick to dismiss things from other contexts without investigating further. And so this is an, it's an interesting piece. And maybe Henry, we can include that in the discussion forum. I have found, I would be super curious to hear from you all what you think of it. Um, again, it's a blog post, so it's not, you know, a val valid research question that's when, you know, so it's not a research study, somebody's opinion that puts some things together, but it is very thought provoking and it also gets to some of the issues that people mentioned earlier around some biases in sort of medical publishing, which is very Western dominated, um, where sometimes and you mentioned this, Henry, you know, the study where authors outside of Western context don't tend to be as often the first authors that some journals might might make comments about like, this is really interesting work, but it's a little bit too niche for us because you're using data from South Africa or from Tanzania or whatever. So those things I think are real. And how do we address them as a community? And more importantly, how do we all help you make sure that your work that's valuable, important, gets out there in the world and overcomes those obstacles? Okay. That were my final words of wisdom. That's all, I got nothing else. Oh, I'm sure you have lots of other things. Um, Isabel, I like your finishing statement. How do we all help you out get there? I like that. That's actually sounds sweet to me. We need you to help us get to that international stage. Well, you said the international stage, and uh, that's what needs to happen, is that there needs to be an international stage. Uh, where there's contributions from international uh, groups uh, contributing uh, to the standards and the guidelines uh, of, of anything, the um, uh, research ethics guidelines, authorship guidelines, research integrity guidelines, uh, and uh, it's a, 
it's again easier said than done. Uh, uh, sometimes there's a lack of access to the international stage. I mean, one could say we're putting on a conference and everyone's invited. Well, guess what? Uh, it, it costs money to uh, travel. Uh, yet, another reason why having Zoom meetings uh, is um, uh, uh, addresses an equity or an inequity issue of accessing international conferences. And that's why I, I like to think the standards in the future will be hybrid conferences where you have face-to-face -face, uh, and, and also virtual. Uh, and in fact, I, I, I met up with that with, with this certificate program. I, I had put down that the uh, second and third conferences would be face-to-face. -face. And uh, I got comments like, uh, well, does it have to be face-to-face? -face? Do we have to attend the face-to-face? And I, I said, well, uh, absolutely not. So let's make it uh, a hybrid at the very least. And in fact, I just may make the whole, the whole, the whole goddamn thing uh, virtual because I may be tired of traveling myself. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, well, I, I don't think that would be the case, but I think the standard would be hybrid to, um, to um, uh, 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 make it more equitable for everyone to attend. And, to, and so that got me off track here. So in order to have an international stage, you have to make sure that everybody has access to the international stage and has the opportunity to have a voice uh, in the international stage. Uh, and, and so... Uh, you raise an interesting point about the guidelines for publishing. Uh, so who was actually involved with establishing those guidelines? Uh, and I must admit, I don't know. I mean, you have the word international guidelines, but, you know, that's, um, that may be inappropriately applied, so... Uh, I don't know, you tell me, are there separate guidelines in Africa for publishing, or do you follow the so-called international guidelines? Uh, I think Emmanuel raised his hand. Yes, I was. And may I go on, Henry? Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, my thoughts in this, and this is strictly my personal thoughts, it's that uh, there ought not be an international, I mean, a, a localized guideline, uh, because research is research, publishing is publishing. And uh, uh, let me uh, not mention the issues that have been largely discussed, issues uh, with junior uh, uh, researchers and senior researchers, cultural issues and other. Research should be uh, research and publications should be publication. And- uh, I'm not but, sure I, I, I know exactly what you mean, but go ahead. Yeah, but the, the truth is that that's same thing you've been saying here since, uh, that uh, what is, is not what really is. I mean, the reality, easier said than done, the reality is that research in some in developing countries and low and middle income countries are quite a little bit uh, challenging. And uh, considering that in institutions, many institutions don't even have a very good uh, review, uh, ethics review board or a very good integrity 
or conflict of interest uh, committee that you can make reports to. It also affects the quality of research that comes out from uh, so many uh, African uh, institutions. And then it looks uh, as if some, a situation whereby friends come to, the gift authorship friends come together. Uh, I mean, in Nigerian situation, there was a time it was very prevalent. Uh, colleagues come together, have their own journal, publish themselves, become professional uh, professors, and the journal uh, is uh, uh, off there. Uh, but there need to be a standard, if you ask me, that everybody strictly adhere to. But if it's existing or not, I don't know. But uh, the reality is that it's not always that. A lot of factors influences how publication uh, goes out in many regions. That's my thinking, my personal thinking. Okay. We appreciate those thoughts. Uh, uh, it's, um, I sometimes think the, um, One, when you think of universal guidelines, because there's different um, cultures, different regions in the world, obviously, but we do live in a globalized world, at least. I, I still would like to think so. Um, and um, the universal guidelines, because of that, are somewhat broad. And the issue is how, how, how you apply them in your locality. Uh, uh, meaning that it's context driven, but it's still fits within the universal guidelines, if that makes any sense. Um, um, but it's an interesting issue of how to make it context responsive. Um, just like um, uh, in, the, in the US when they um, started to establish research ethics committees. We had regulations and the concept was to have research reviewed by local committees who knew the local context. Uh, and because the local context uh, may be different from region to region because within the local context, there may be um, uh, different cultures, even, you know, obviously within the same country. So there is that concept of the local context. Um, but I think that, um, uh, uh, again, I'm thinking that there are some things that are, should not be permitted. And I'm, I'm not adding any any um, uh, um, um, more advice when I say this, but I, it, well, uh, you have something that could be widely accepted within a broad range, but there is something that is definitely, I, and I don't like, using that word definitely, but something that should be not, should be unacceptable in all cultures is what I'm trying to say, uh, if that's making any sense. Like gift authorship. I, I don't see how any, any, any context could justify that. That may be something easy to say. So, Anyway, um, why don't, uh, this has been a very interesting discussion. Uh, and, uh, and it's been great hearing all these thoughts. 
And thank goodness for the chat box. Uh, and 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 I'll 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 share the chat file. I could download that and I'll put it on the um, uh, website. But um, we were supposed to go into uh, breakout rooms and look at the protocols, but it's uh, too late for that. Uh, I think we're, uh, some people are nearing bedtime. Um, and, uh, uh, and even if you're not nearing bedtime, I think there's a, a limit to how much virtual stuff we could do. Though uh, so I think we're very much engaged and I, I think it's a wonderful group. Uh, and it's been fantastic. So let me um, let me say this. Let me um, uh, again, uh, with the goal of making sure that by the end of tomorrow, everybody is on a uh, 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 on the track towards progressing with their proposals. So uh, I think it would be helpful to. Um, you know, write down your research question and your objectives. And if you have time, if you want to uh, uh, give a thought to your methodology, that would be helpful too. But I think it would be very helpful to write down what is your research question um, and, and what are your specific objectives. And one could tell a lot by the verbs that you're going to use in your objectives. And, and, uh, uh, and let's look at that. And, and let's uh, tomorrow spend a little bit more time than what was, um, uh, well, we'll spend as much time tomorrow in in the small working groups, working on the proposal so that we can keep on making progress. How, how does that sound? Okay. That sound, okay, all right. Yeah. Okay, why don't we, um, uh, I'm glad you all understood what I said. I'm not sure of myself if I <laughs> really understand what I just said, but it sounds good. So let's run with it. Henry, okay. somebody has a question in the in the chat. Farad is asking about conducting qualitative interviews via Zoom. Do you want to take a look, quick look at that? Oh yeah, well the short answer is yes. And the reason why I say yes is I've done it already. <laughs> in fact, I've done focus groups uh, of like uh, two, three and four people using Zoom. And mm -hmm. in fact, it's much easier to set up a focus group by Zoom, right? Than trying to get people together face to face. In fact, I don't see myself ever doing a focus group face to face because it takes so much time to arrange it. And then you gotta feed the people, right? When they show up, right? So that costs money, okay? Uh, so uh, Zoom it is. Uh, there's uh, no, no issues with um, confidence, no extra issues with privacy and confidentiality. And in fact, when I submitted my um, proposal, to the research ethics committee saying, I'm gonna use Zoom for my focus group. I thought I was gonna have a hard time. They didn't make any comments about the fact I was using Zoom. But of course, you know, that was in, uh, in, uh, um, during the pandemic, uh, which we still have, but, uh, I don't, I think they understood why I was using Zoom and now we're contemplating 
doing interviews, in-depth interviews using the mobile, right? Um, so I think that uh, uh, the technology works. Okay. Uh, right. Yes, why not? Okay, very good. So any other final questions? Yes, Emmanuel. I just want to give strength, uh, well, of course, my little strength to what you have just said. Uh, I just, uh, I, I did a consultancy uh, in May through June, and uh, we did in-depth interviews with Zoom, okay, uh, Microsoft Teams, and it went through the ethical review process and it was uh, approved. So I thought to myself, if we could do in that interview, why not focus group? Yes, and like you really said, like you've really said, it saves you a lot of money. You don't buy tea and lunch. Well, but it, it's a, it's also a lot easier to get people together by Zoom. Now there may be an issue with the select. There may be selection bias in terms of who has access to the technology. So if you're trying to have focus groups in rural areas, that might be difficult. But even then, uh, that's why, uh, well, it's hard to have a focus group by, by mobile. but you can have interviews by mobile. So you have to think about the um, selection bias when you're using technology. So just, just something to, to think about. True. Yeah, okay. Great, that's... Uh, okay, all right, so... This has been another, another fruitful day. I thank everyone for attending and uh, enjoy the, the rest of the day. And um, uh, we'll, um, we'll see you tomorrow, same time, same, same Zoom details. Okay, all right, have a good Bye. one, guys. Okay. Bye. 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 Everybody. Lovely evening for those this part of the world. <laughs> and lovely afternoon for Isabel. All right, Emmanuel. All right, all right. Thank all right. you, Prof. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> That's right. I might take a nap. <laughs> See you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye now.